Welcome back to my channel. I'm Brian Kapke, and in this video, we're going to be talking about Apache Airflow architecture. And for those so inclined, I'd appreciate if you consider supporting me on my Patreon channel on my mission to train the world on new technologies. Where are we going? We'll start by what is Airflow? Then we'll talk about Airflow architecture at 50,000 feet, then Airflow concepts, and Airflow considerations and parsimony. If you're familiar, I actually already did a video, which is a bit controversial, where I said, don't use Apache Airflow. It wasn't really meant to be a complete don't use it as much as a look into it and understand it better before you make that decision video. But I wanted to make sure people took a look because most people just kind of gush over Airflow. It's awesome. It's great. But they don't really look at the cost. So I want to try to be a little more realistic in this video, and this will help explain some of those pieces and what Airflow is all about. So let's start with what is Airflow? Airflow is an open source Linux-based workflow engine. Key thing to understand there is that it is a workflow engine. Essentially, it's a job scheduler, but it's a job scheduler that lets you create very complex dependencies and parallel execution and things like that. So it's Microsoft Windows has a workflow engine that has been there for a while. I've used it with PowerShell and C-Sharp can use it. Airflow definitely takes it a step up with the complexity and scale out capabilities. Now, why does it have such a cool name? You see Airflow and you see this little uh, pinwheel thing here. And it's kind of like, wow, it makes you want to stop and say, what's going on there? Well, the reason for the name is actually because it was created originally by Airbnb. They open sourced this workflow engine. And so when you put Airbnb and you take part of it and you put it with workflow, you get Airflow. And the idea behind it, which is a pretty cool idea, is defining the workflow itself using a directed acyclic graph, which you see here. You can think of this kind of a graph used in many things you see it in social media, right? You've got, you know, Mary connected to Bob and Harry and Harry connected to Mary Sue and, and Lisa and on and on. There's a kind of a hierarchy, right, of relationships. A cyclic means not cyclical. It means it can't loop back on itself. It has to be a tree structure that never loops back. So in this diagram, we see A and A connects to B and C. B connects only to D, but C connects to E and F. And in airflow terms, in airflow terms, this means that task A is followed by B and C, which can actually run concurrently. B is followed by D, and C is followed by E and F, which can run concurrently. So it's defining the order of execution. So it's defining the order of execution. Let's take a look at airflow at 50,000 feet, just to kind of touch base on a few things here. As I mentioned, it is Linux only, and that's not clear from the documentation because it will say you can install it on Windows. But what they really mean is you have to activate and use the Linux kernel in Windows to get it working. So you're really always running it as a Linux application, or technically a suite of Linux applications. It is built on Python, meaning that it uses a lot of different Python services to support what you're doing. And again, it is a workflow engine service. So the idea is it's coordinating a lot of different tasks and the dependencies between them and the execution of them and logging and tracking, et cetera, which is great. So that's what it's really designed to do. It includes a web server to support a user interface web app. So you can go in and check out your workflows, see what's happening, see what's failed, see what's succeeding, et cetera, et cetera. And not only is it built on Python, but it leverages Python libraries to do your work, in particular, libraries to create your DAG. So this diagram shows you the overall architecture of Airflow. It starts at the top, you need to have something to store the state data. This is what is being used by the scheduler and executor while you're running your DAGs. It's called the metadata database, and you need to have something to back that up. Where is it going to store that? Now, by default, it will use SQLite, and you don't have to do much. It will create the SQLite database and all the things needed to get things running initially. But it's unlikely that's going to support your real needs for a production environment. So you'll probably want to change it over to Postgres Microsoft SQL Server, Oracle, or some other type of database. Now we have a scheduler and executor, and this may look similar to Apache Spark if you've taken a look at that. What's interesting here is the executor can run within the scheduler process, so you can kind of keep it all as one, and you don't necessarily have to scale out to workers. And that's okay if you want to just kind of create a sort of hello world, kind of a learning environment or development environment to test in, but you're probably going to want to scale out using workers, in which case the executor runs the workers and controls the workers separately to make sure it's scaled out. As far as the workers themselves, those are computers that you are going to need to create to support what you do. So on-premises, this could be a fairly complex thing to do, but if you're in a cloud environment, 
it shouldn't be a difficult task to get those workers created and used. Configuring it to use a scale-out architecture like Kubernetes is probably a bit more involved, but it is doable and probably easier in a cloud environment. The DAG directory, you can see at the bottom here of the slide. At the bottom of the slide, you see the DAG directory. That's the folder where you store your Python DAG definitions. And the schedule will pick those up and it will be visible through the web UI. Now, the thing is, you're probably not going to want to be working directly in there, and you don't typically. You would copy over your DAGs into that folder. So you're going to use an Airflow library to define your DAGs. One thing I would caution you when you install your environment, you're getting it set up. I kind of learned this the hard way. I went in on the WSL, which is the Linux kernel on my Windows machine, and I just said, go for it. And I noticed it started deinstalling and backpedaling on some of my libraries in Python. It uses a lot of libraries, lots of dependencies. So I do recommend if you're doing this, even in a dev environment, make sure you use a virtual environment in Python. It's going to probably save you some trouble. You do also have a web service and you have a web app user interface. So you can go in and see all the cool things happening. That user interface is really cool. It gives you a lot of insight. You can see into everything. And that's probably one of the strongest features that sells Airflow. If you are installing this under Windows, the Windows Linux UI does not support daemons. And oftentimes the web server is run as a daemon in the background. So you will need to run multiple terminal windows to be able to support the web app, the web server, and the scheduler service. So it can take several different terminal windows to get that running. And by the way, this is a lot easier to install and run everything in a Linux environment. It's uh, While you can do it on Windows, it's a lot more work to get it set up. And I do recommend you're pretty comfortable working in the Linux environment in general, installing things and getting things set up because it's not really a trivial exercise. The complexity of setting up your environment is going to have a lot to do with how much you want to scale out. If you want to scale out to something like Kubernetes, you're probably going to have a lot more work involved, getting things defined and up and running and monitoring and maintaining it. If you run it on a single, say, powerful virtual machine, probably not as bad to do it, but you won't get the same amount of scale. Something else you do have is the executors. You start with the sequential executor by default, and that just lets you get kind of started. It's kind of the hello world kind of environment. You can upgrade that to the local executor itself, and that'll let you work on a local machine. It's not scaled out, but you can do some things, and that may actually work out in many cases if you don't have a really heavy workload. But then you have a bunch of remote executors, and that's where you get into some more complexity, but you get better scale, like using the Celery executor or Kubernetes or Dask. And there's a lot of security options here as well. So take a look at that online. I put the link in the slide. Let's talk about a few of the concepts that you need to understand to use Airflow. First one is tasks. The second one is control flow. And then finally, we'll talk a little more about that user interface. So we talked about the DAG a little bit. You got here A, B, C. The task itself is the node we see like A. That's the work you're going to be performing. So you can picture this sort of like a function, right? You have a function. It's going to do task A. You'll have another function for B, another function for C. But you need to define the dependencies between them, what runs first, et cetera. So this shows you that you have control flow, which is the line that connects the two. A runs first, followed by B and C, which can run in parallel. And this is only one example, but just to give you a flavor of how you would tell Airflow the order of the task, you can see here you would say A using the bitwise operator here, so two greater than signs, and then B and C enclosed in brackets. Now, a task consists of something called operators, and at the very root of it all is called the base operator. So operators really form the extensibility of the Airflow engine itself. It's a very powerful feature because it's a very plug-and-play kind of thing. You can write your own operators. There's tons and tons of them out there that will connect to and run just about anything you can think of. So I'm listing here are just a few of them. You have an operator to run bash scripts or an operator to run Python scripts or to do email to connect to databases or connect to different external services. So the operators is really a nice feature and it's a good architectural concept because it abstracts away the complexity of connecting to different resources. You also have something called sensors. Sensors really control when things run. So it's really like waiting for something. You can either have a time-based sensor or an event-based. Time-based being run this at 2 a.m. You know, every day or maybe run this every three hours. The event base being something like a file drops in a folder and then do something. And finally, you have a task flow. And task flow let you run custom Python functions that you can package up. And the example here shows you some code, which is a really simple thing. But again, you can see that the library is being pulled in. The Airflow decorator is import task and then use a decorator task from the import. And you can define your function, which now can be used. 
And I don't have enough time in this video without extending it quite a bit to demonstrate the user interface. But I do want to talk about the fact that it is a very cool feature. Probably my favorite thing about Airflow is the web app user interface because it shows you like just about everything you could want to know about your DAGs. When did they run? Did they succeed? Each step within a DAG, did it run? Did it not? Et cetera. So it's a very cool thing. It has security features you can administrate by giving users access to the web user interface. Lots of good stuff here. The only thing I would say about this that I don't like is it doesn't have any ability at all to create a simple DAG. And it would be nice to have an easy way that you could get up and started with Airflow and then just do like a hello world and see how it works. And you can look at a DAG. You can actually look at the code behind a DAG. So it would really be nice if you could even just paste a DAG into a window and run it just as a way to sort of learn about it. I don't know if anyone's out there that wants to add that feature, but I would be a big proponent for that. So some airflow consideration. Each DAG must end before it can be executed again. Now, you can have many different DAGs for different purposes running simultaneously. That's not a problem. But if you have a specific DAG that's waiting for like a store file folder to come up, and it's going to grab that file and process it and maybe put it into a data lake, it must finish that single job before it can start the job again. It does not support streaming. So weirdly, when you hear airflow and everything else, you might think, oh, yeah, it'd be great for streaming. But if you think about the way I've explained this and, and what it really does is it's a batch oriented kind of process. It's a workflow that can do many things, but it has a beginning that kicks off at some interval and then runs to the end. So it's really not designed to support streaming data. Now, if you want to use Airflow, which I think many people do, to execute jobs that are really external to the Airflow environment, then you're going to get into, I think, a lot more complexity. And I would suggest considering that and maybe testing and vetting it out before you do that. What do you mean, Brian? Well, let's look here. We have Apache Airflow, right? Great. We're ready to run. And we want to run stuff in Apache Spark or Databricks. And we have Snowflake over here. We want to run some stuff in there too. So we're going to call out using an operator to run something in Apache Spark or Databricks. And that means there's going to be dependencies. Suppose the version of Apache Spark has shifted. It's gone. They've upgraded. They went to a major new release. Well, it could be that the connector we're using, the operator, isn't going to succeed anymore. There are dependencies. So we can run into any kinds of problems, not to mention that the environment itself is separate and could have its own issues and could give you trouble if something ships. So just then in general, when you're maintaining multiple environments and interfaces between them, there's a lot of overhead. And the same thing goes for you know, what connecting to Snowflake. You can do it, but there's a certain looseness in the interfacing between them. A sort of We like the idea of decoupled, but sometimes that decoupling means that one process is kind of blind to the other process too. So something could fail and you may not even know it. Or as I mentioned, you may have something fail because things have changed in the other environment. So be aware of that because I think that's a very popular use case. And I would just make sure that you don't have trouble with that if you decide to go that route. In my last video, I said, don't use Apache Airflow. What I really wanted to emphasize in there is something called parsimony. Now, let me explain. When I did that video, I found it very interesting that probably about 80% of the people who saw that video, and I will put a link in the description so you can watch that riveting video, but about 80% said, yeah, I agree. I tried it. It's difficult. It's not simple. It doesn't work. My main point was that the documentation, the sort of hype around it is, this is great. It's cool. Nobody said anything negative about Airflow ever. It was always pushed as sort of a data ETL, data processing engine, get data from here, transform it, et cetera, and land it somewhere else. And it is not a data centric engine at all. It has nothing to do with data. There are some really good operators which make doing that easier, but it's just a workflow engine. It's designed to handle dependencies between tasks. Now, I did get about 20% or so were like, well, I like it. It's great. It does what I need. It's good. But they weren't doing any depth of thinking like, yeah, it may be great. It may do what you want. You may just be, you know, sending an email to your Aunt Edna every Tuesday to tell her to have a nice day. You can certainly use Airflow to do something like that, but is it the right choice? So the word I use for this is parsimony. Parsimony meaning don't do anything more or less than what you need. It's the sweet spot. It's what you get what you want at the least cost. And cost means any kind of complexity or resources, et cetera, that are expended on it. So let's use this sort of diagram here. I want to diagram this out into a little chart. Your goal is to find the optimal balance between the workflow requirements and the cost and complexity. Let's take one example. The requirements are going out horizontally. So we see that we're not getting a lot of requirements met, but the cost is very high. This would be a really poor choice. It could meet our needs, but it's very expensive. It takes a lot of developer time. Things are breaking all the time. People are trying to figure out what went wrong and fixing it, whatever, a lot of different things going on there. On the other hand, we could have something like this, where we have low cost, but it meets a lot of requirements. It solves a lot of issues. That would be the ideal case. 
usually it's not quite that good either. It's somewhere in between the two. But I would say, for instance, one of the reasons I push Databricks so much is that I find Databricks gives you an awful lot of value, makes things really easy to do at a low cost. You can just pop in and start doing things. You can be up and running in Databricks on Azure, for instance, in 10 minutes, and you can bring in data and stop playing around. You're productive pretty much immediately. So even the barrier to just learning about it and saying, does it work, is low. And you can scale it up and it will turn off processes. It'll turn off the clusters when they're not needed. So I know I push it heavily, but the reason I like it is parsimony. It does what you want at an optimal cost, at least the way I see it. I'm sure there are cases where it's not ideal and I wouldn't use it in all cases, but that's where I like it. Airflow is something you have to be careful of because it is fairly high cost. You've got a number of demons and processes running in the background. You've got a lot of moving parts the web server and the web app, which has to be maintained. You've got the executor and the scheduler running, and it will probably take at least a few machines just to run the basic processes. And now if you scale it out to something like Kubernetes, it's cool, it can scale, but is it really gonna be easy to administer and maintain? A lot of devs may say, yeah, it works great, but they're probably not the ones that had to install and get it running in the first place. Bear that in mind, and you have to look at this over the long haul. Maybe it works great, maybe it does what you want, but is it the easiest thing? If you're running just sequential jobs, just run this, 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 and done, you can probably do it with cron or some sort of job scheduler. And granted, cron is a very limited job scheduler. So you could buy a third party one that is, you know, better and it gives you logs and messages, et cetera. But I would say just bear in mind, parsimony, that's the key. I'd also mention that you need to be pretty comfortable working in a Linux environment to set it up and get this working. So for Windows people, which is my main background, it is more challenging, admittedly. But I have worked with Linux a while and I had to ramp up to kind of get more handle on Airflow. I'll also add to this that Airflow is a very Python-centric service. It's not bad, it's not good. If it fits your needs, if you're a very big Python shop, yes. Uh, comments I had before also were like, hey, you can run Bash scripts, you can use this, et cetera. Yes, but you cannot create the DAGs and the services that it's running are built on Python. So you wanna make sure that That's really what you want for the language and everything, since you're going to be building a lot off of it. And I think it's great if you're strictly a Python shop, you build everything in Python, and that's what you want to do for for your data movement, et cetera, whatever you're doing it for. But if it's not, you may be extending, again, a lot more resources and complexity. You may have a hard time having the people in-house to have the skills to support and maintain it going forward. So wrapping up, we talked about what Airflow is, and we learned that it's a workflow scheduler built and maintained via Python. And it only runs on Linux. We talked about the Airflow architecture at 50,000 feet. And we just talked about some very basic ideas about how Airflow works. And then we get into more of the Airflow concepts around the DAG, the control flow, et cetera, and all the pieces. And we talked about considerations on when you're going to use Airflow or any service to do work. And the considerations need to be balanced against parsimony, right? Is it the optimal solution? Not just will it do what you need, but is it the best solution to do what you need? Does it result in getting you what you need at the lowest cost, the lowest work, et cetera. That's really the key. So I want to thank you. Please like, share, subscribe, welcome your messages. Until next time, I'm pulling for you. We're all in this together. Thank you.